Well, tonight we're privileged to have a, a really great presentation uh, from the Klamath Bird Observatory. Uh, our speaker is Elva Marquesa. I, um, I'm not sure if I got that right, but, um, but uh, she is the manager for uh, KBO's Science Communications Outreach and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Manager. Uh, she has a master's in environmental education from Southern Oregon University and is an Oregon-born na native uh, raised in the Willamette Valley. Anyway, uh, Elva enjoys sharing her passion for the environment and bird conservation. So we have a really exciting program. She's going to tell us about uh, some of the stuff that uh, KBO is doing. Without further ado, I'll let her tell you all about it. Thank you. Elva? Thank you for inviting me to present to you all today. Uh, John, can you just see my slides? Uh, no, not yet. Here we are. Okay. Uh, we can see the slide and some around the edge of the screen also. Okay, got it. You got it. You're good. It disappeared. Still, there you go. There, perfect. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Sorry for the complications. Um, so today I'm going to be covering the uh, variety of tracking technology conservation projects that Klamath Bird Observatory um, has done over the years. But first, I would like to um, give you a little more background information about Klamath Bird Observatory. So our mission is to advance bird and habitat conservation through science, education, and partnerships. And we do this uh, through three ways, through our long-term monitoring, applied ecology, and theoretical research. Our uh, research and work reaches uh, hemispherically, but we're based out of Ashland, Oregon. A lot of our on-the-ground work uh, happens within the klamath Siskiyou bioregion, but we've been expanding. Um, our regional work within the Pacific Northwest is through the Avian Knowledge Northwest, which is a node of the Avian Knowledge Network, which is a really awesome database where scientists from all over the United States can um, put in their data, and the data is stored and used for various tools and applications studying things like climate change, or a population distribution. And then we also have our international partnerships and capacity building. And a lot of this is done through our bird banding program um, that is stationed here in Southern Oregon. My position is relatively new to KBO. I've been with the organization for about two and a half years. And as part of my job um, is the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice manager is increasing our reach within the community for outreach and education, as well as using that lens throughout our research and professional development. So one of the programs that I have developed is Bird Comigo, where we provide uh, bilingual bird walks uh, throughout the Rogue Valley, as well as all of our outreach materials are in Spanish. And we work a lot with our local other environmental nonprofits to help host events like Rogue Valley Bird Day and making sure that all of the event materials are in Spanish and that we're um, advertising it to the Latinx community. Also through our professional training program with the banding program, a lot of our international students come from Sp Spanish speaking communities. Um, and bird banding can be a very complicated profession to learn. There's a lot of terminology. Um, and so we, uh, with um, the Bird Population Institute, 
got the guide to North American birds translated into Spanish. And so a lot of people might know this as the Bird Banders Bible. Um, and we think this will be a very huge help in our training program, other training programs throughout the U.S. and Mexico, and hopefully will help increase uh bird banding throughout the Western Hemisphere. So today I'm here um, to talk to you about tracking migratory birds. And so I will be specifically talking about geolocators and GPS tags. Um, we do use metal rings and color markers. Um, metal rings are the ones we use in bird banding and I will bring up color markers. They're usually mixed in with other projects. Um, and we haven't quite gotten to satellite tags yet. So the first uh, project I'd like to talk to you about is the tracking of the yellow-breasted chat. Um, and so this was done in partnership with a university in Canada. And so we used uh, the geolocators, which you can see over there on the right, and they're quite small. Um, on the bird itself, you can see on that uh, on the yellow-breasted chat over there, you can kind of see this little piece sticking out in the back, and it's very tiny. And you'll see in comparison to some of the other tags uh, that I will be showing you, it is very small and it's lightweight, which is really great for our smaller songbirds. Um, but this only uses um, the rising of uh, sunlight to detect where the bird is. Um, across latitudes. And so it doesn't give a whole lot of information. Um, and you also have to catch the bird um, after it's gone through a full migratory season to collect the data, uh, which can be hard. Um, it It's hard to catch the birds to get the tags on and even harder in hopes that they return, that we can recapture the birds to get the data and the tags survived um, that long, the battery lived that long and the bird lived that long. Um, but what we were studying is, so KBO did um, a research project on the Trinity River in California using these geolocators on yellow-breasted chats. And then a research partner in Canada tagged using GPS tags, yellow-breasted chats in, um, in Southern Canada. And actually in Southern Canada, the yellow-breasted chat is uh, petitioned to be listed as endangered. And so what we were really hoping to learn about this study is where do yellow-breasted chats go? And that's one of the main things that we're always trying to learn with these uh, migratory tracking studies is where do our breeding birds that we have in the U.S., where are their wintering grounds? There's only so much conservation you can do on one part of a migratory bird's annual life cycle. And so um, you are using tags, we're expanding our knowledge and as well as learning where we need to build relationships and partnerships with other researchers to complete the conservation cycle. And so what they did see was that the majority of our Western um, yellow-breasted chats traveled down to Western Mexico. Um, and because of the GPS tags, which these ones, um, the GPS tags that were put on the birds in Southern Canada um, also stored the data on the GPS tag, but at certain intervals that researchers can um, require the tag to collect, will collect data from satellites at certain points. And so you can kind of see those larger dots on the map, and those are the times that the tag collected the point. And so it helps us know, you know when it started at point A and traveled to point B, we can see how long that took. And then also it helps us understand a little, little bit of like where they might be making over some winter stops. Um, and they were seeing um, a lot of the wintering grounds they found in conifer forests, um, but they also saw that half of the birds visited croplands as well. So most of the wintering grounds um, that these birds traveled to had some sort of human interference. Um, and we were lucky enough to have partners in that part of Mexico that went and traveled and investigated those wintering grounds. But this is just um, part of the story of understanding the migratory path paths of these yellow-breasted chats, understanding where we can um, apply conservation on the ground to help better these populations. 
Another project that we are a part of is the Metal Lark Migratory Cacnivity Project. And this is done through the Smithsonian. And so um, we are just one of many partners. And it's a very unique project because they are studying Western and Eastern metal larks and their migratory pathways. And this is really important because metal larks um, we've been seeing a 70% decline in Eastern populations and in Western population, we've seen a 40% decline since 1970. Um, and as well, we've been losing millions of acres of grassland habitat. And so these birds, these uh, meadow larks are actually really great grassland habitat indicators. And so the fact that we're losing them along with the habitat itself is a, a really big red flag. Um, and so to help better understand all the habitat usage that metal larks are using, um, the Smithsonian started this project. Um, and so we've been used, and so they supply the tags, which is great. Um, and as you can tell from this photo, um, these tags are much bigger. And these are because these communicate with satellites directly. Um, so this will send up data directly to satellites that which will then send to the researcher, which is really nice because we only have to capture these birds once um, to put the tags on them and we don't have to recapture them again to collect the data. And so um, as a part of our project, we uh, sent out 35 tags um, on Western Meadowlarks along the Table Rocks area. Um, and we started this project in 2022. And the first set of data that we have received has shown that some of our Western metal larks are acting as residents and they're breeding and wintering around the Tape Rocks area. And some are only part of the population is migrating um, to Northern California. And it's cool because we're also seeing Western metal larks in the West part of Ma uh, Montana on the other side of the Rockies, on our side of the Rockies, that are going down and um, using the same wintering grounds. And we've also gotten a couple winter um, at Table Rocks as well. Uh, but the project isn't complete yet. We still have one more year of migratory data to collect. Um, and so we're really excited to see what um, the data will show us at the end of uh, 2024. Next, I'd like to give you guys an Oregon Vesper Sparrow update. Um, this project is led by research biologist, Dr. Sarah Rockwell. Um, and I know a couple of years ago, she came and gave you, uh, presented on the Oregon Vesper Sparrow as well. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, um, but this is a um, one of our species specific research projects. Um, and so in 2021, we sent out 15 tags. Um, and in 2023, we were able to send out another 15. Um, and these were just um, satellite, uh, not satellite, these were just um, um, archival tags. Um, so we had to recollect them. And then we also used uh, MODIS tags, which I will go in a little more depth a little bit later. As you can see, the GPS tags um, on the back of these Oregon Vesper Sparrows are quite tiny. Um, and you can kind of see um, in the hand there, um, the little loops. And so their legs will go through the loops and that sits very nicely um, on their back. And we were able to um, recapture several male Vesper Sparrow birds um, and analyze the data. And we're very excited about it. Um, and we made, uh, it's only uh, about three minutes, a little short uh, video, um, so you can follow their journey down to the wintering grounds. Vesper Sparrow, the abundance of this unique, the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, the abundance of this unique Pacific Northwest subspecies declined by 90% from 1968 to 2015. The current population size is estimated to only be about 3,000 individuals.
Due to these dramatic changes, the subspecies is under review for listing as endangered or threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. In 2021, Klamath Bird Observatory recaptured three males wearing GPS backpacks. These data help tell the story of where this vulnerable species travels and what conservation challenges they may be facing throughout the year. Here is their story. Um, looking to share their um, their migratory path back up to the breeding grounds. They should actually, our Vester Sparrow should start showing back up within the next week or two um, and start, the males will start defending their territories. Um, so another type of tag that we've been using on the Oregon Vesper Sparrow is MODIS. Um, and MODIS is a really cool um, GPS type technology that allows researchers to really come together and support each other more in I feel like a community science sort of way. Because once you get the funding and put up a MODIS station um, for your own projects, you're also helping other researchers check their own birds. Um, so for example, we have the tower that you see in the picture on the left. It's at a building um, at on top of um, or the Vesper Spar Vesper, sorry, Vesper Meadow. Um, in this tower, we've picked up um, a variety of Lewis's woodpeckers that were tagged in Montana um, and then have been flying um, kind of diagonally through Oregon. Um, and so by having this tower up, we're also providing data for other projects, which is really cool. And then in the middle, there is a, a CTT life tag. And so this is what the tags look like uh, for use with MODIS. Uh, we're using this 
uh, modus to really study and understand the way that our organ vesper sparrows are using the grassland habitats around them. Um, we've been, we have two sites specifically that we've been working at lately. And so we've been using the antenna there to kind of walk around and see where are fledglings hanging out? Where do birds kind of return to? Um, and if we notice that any are starting to miss, you know, are they already moving? Or if birds that are supposed to return with like tags aren't returning back to the their same breeding meadows, you know, where else might they be going? And this antenna allows us to kind of walk around the, the prairie without stepping on any eggs or interfering with any nesting habitat. And then we've been setting up nodes as well. And so the MODIS tower is supposed to have about a 12 mile um, radius, but that is in perfect uh, geography conditions um, where that isn't always the case. Um, and so by putting up the nodes, um, in, this, in the surrounding glasslands, we are able to pick up Vester Sparrows from farther away, and we're also starting to expand into neighboring grasslands um, next to Lily Glen and uh, Vesper Meadow to see if maybe some of our fledglings that are returning are um, nesting elsewhere because we're kind of we're seeing a lower return rate of our nestlings or fledglings compared to the project. Um, setting Oregon Vesper Sparrows in the Willamette Valley. A lot of this um, data we've been collecting on the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, we have been giving to um, land managers. And so this year we've created a handout for the Jackson County Park, which owns Lily Glen, um, one of our research study sites, just to let them know kind of, you know, the the Oregon West Sparrow's nesting habits, you know, when are they starting to breed? Um, when do nests, you know, completely fledge? Because a lot of their land management techniques, you know, include like things like mowing. Um, and so to make sure that those nests don't get mowed over, um, as well as, you know, we understand fire is a very big issue in our area. And so keeping down dead grass is important in certain spots. Um, and so encouraging them to start to mow before our males and before our Vesper Sparrows start to build their nests um, so they can try and find nesting in other areas of sporting, spending too much energy, um, as well as encouraging to try and mow as late as possible if they're going to start and mowing a new area for fire protection, just so that we can get more of those eggs hatched and fledglings out of the nest. Um, and that is a right, uh, on the right, that is a photo of some Oregon Vesper Sparrow eggs. Another project I'd like to talk to you guys about is our Western Purple Marge Martin project. Um, the lead on this is Deanna from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and this is a really interesting project because kind of like with the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, where we have a very specific subpopulation um, on the West Coast. Um, there's also the Eastern Purple Martin, where our subpopulation is quite small um, over here for our Western Purple Martins. And where the Eastern Purple Martins have been, um, have lost a lot of their nesting habitat and rely almost 100% on humans putting up nest boxes. Whereas our Western Purple Martins are starting to do that, um, but we're trying to um, better understand the population so that in hopes that we can make sure that they don't become 100% reliant on human nest boxes. Um, but for this project, we did build a very... Um, very specific next boxes that allow for easier removal. So you can see um, uh, there's uh, Joe, one of our research partners with the net. We wait until it's late at night and the purple martins have gone into their nest boxes and are sleeping. Um, and we're able to use this um, tool that he created himself to gently take off the next bo nest boxes, cover the hole so they can escape. And that way we can, you know, measure chicks um, see egg success, and as well as tag uh, the purple martins that are in the box.
Well, thank you for the question. Can I, I will uh, get to that after the presentation. There we go. Um, and so you can see our uh, GPS tag um, that we use down there. Um, it is quite small. Um, we have to make sure to use very size specific for each bird. Um, and we also make sure to weigh them before applying the tags. Just there is a weight uh, kind of limitation. So if the bird um, isn't quite big enough, we don't put the tag on. Um, and so, and again, these are the type of GPS tags where we have to recapture the birds after they've gone on their full migratory route to uh, collect and analyze the data. We, um, about two years ago, we were able to collect, um, we were able to have one female return back to us from the wintering grounds. Um, we named her Hosha, uh, which is purple in Brazilian Portuguese. Um, and we uh, created a short video of her journey down to Brazil and back. Cool thing about um, 
finding out where Hosha was traveling to for winter grounds um, is that there is a purple martin um, research down in Brazil happening in, in tangent with ours. Um, and so we're really able to communicate um, about where our purple martins that we've been tracking are going, where they're pit stopping and where they're overwintering. Um, and they can't pick out um, the specific ones, but um, they can look in on the habitat and we can really start to collaborate on making sure that these amazing birds um, throughout their full annual life cycle um, are protected. Um, and that's kind of the major theme of um, all these migratory projects is that we've been using techniques like bird banding to understand populations for a very long time. Um, but thankfully to next to new technologies, we are able to expand our knowledge on where our migratory birds are going um, and what collaborations and partnerships we need to be building to be able to protect these birds on their full annual life cycle. Um, because the work that we just do on their breeding grounds or just on their breeding grounds um, isn't going to be as effective unless we work together. Um, thank you uh, for listening to me talk today about our various projects that we have done and are currently doing, um, tracking migratory patterns of various birds. Um, and this is just a lovely photo of our banding crew from uh, last year. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Elva. Um, do any questions for the audience that are sitting around the tables here? I have one. Um, I was curious about uh, the size of the tag that you uh, that you use uh, for the uh, what was that the the modus uh, tag or how do you Differentiate that between the the small little backpack uh, one uh, for the GPS. Uh, are there are they different sizes or uh, how does that work? Yeah, so they're a little bit in, different in size. The life tags for Modus, you could tell um, they were uh, quite a bit longer, um, whereas the other um, more ar archival GPS tags are a little square. Um, but they're thicker. So it, the weight is just a little differently dis distributed um, within the tags themselves. So they, the modus tags look um, bigger, um, but they weigh pretty much the same. So we have a couple of questions from Zoom. One is uh, the Oregon Vesper Sparrows uh, are subspecies that breed in the west of the Cascades in the Rogue Valley. However, it's determined that the birds you are tracking are Oregon Vesper Sparrows and not. So the question is, how is it determined that you know that they are the Oregon Vesper Sparrow and not the Great uh, Basin uh, Vesper Sparrow? Uh, that's a great uh, question. And um, I'm, I'm not the lead on the research project. Uh, so I don't fully know uh, the answer uh, to your question. Um, without just making assumptions. Um, Question. Just... How does, does anyone of the, <laughs> so how, the other question is, how are other, um, are there other species that your team is planning on documenting? Um, not at the moment, um, we, because our Purple Martin and Oregon Vesper Sparrow projects are still uh, active. So usually we we associate uh, western meadowlarks with grasslands, but I was out in western I was out in eastern Oregon this last weekend where it was just sagebrush, and boy the 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 the, the meadowlarks were were doing quite well, and I was wondering to what extent sagebrush represents a suitable habitat for our western meadowlarks. Yeah, um, because of there's a lot of agriculture kind of too as well on with sagebrush usually there's a lot of hay um cattle farming um and so metal larks tend to use those habitats in sagebrush areas um it's not um 
terrible habitat for them, but it's usually because there's agriculture uh, nearby that they can uh, really sustain on. Thank you. Any questions in the room? Well, thank you, Elva. That was fascinating, especially that, that last little bit about that. Uh, bird that went all the way to uh, Brazil. That was amazing. Uh, and that was all determined through uh, netting? Yeah, so that was determined uh, through uh, the GPS tags. Um, so we um, capture them um, when they're in their nest boxes. Um, and then that way they're quite easy to capture and handle. Um, and we put the little GPS bags, pack packs on her. And then when she came back up um, and started to nest again, we were able to capture her in the box again um, and collect that backpack from her and look at the data. That's a long trip, round trip. I mean, I can't imagine going that far and being able to find that same bird after all those miles. Wow. That is yeah. some, some kind of research. That's, uh, that's amazing. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. You've really enjoyed uh, the presentation and learning all about some of the things that KBO is doing. And boy, these projects are really amazing. It looks oh. like uh, Michael Babbitt has his hand raised. Oh. I'll give him permission to talk. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for getting on. I, thank you, Elva, for noticing that I had my hand up. Uh, yeah, this is Michael Babbitt, and uh, I want to thank you for the presentation. I found it really interesting. Uh, but you raised something that I've kind of wondered about uh, having to do with the purple martins. If I understood you correctly, you said that the eastern purple martins tend to be pretty dependent on human-made nest boxes. And I'm wondering, to, to what extent is that different for the Western purple martins? Is that, are they less dependent on humans? Or could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. So the populations we've been seeing um, on the West, for the Western purple martins aren't as dependent on human nest boxes. We're still seeing several pockets um, that are using, you know, snags and other things um, for as nesting cavities um, instead of, being completely reliant on nest boxes. Um, but it is becoming more of a need, um, especially I feel like in our kind of coastal areas, um, the purple martins are needing these nest boxes. And it's mostly because of loss of nesting habitat. Yeah. And would these snags that they use tend to be near water or over water, like the boxes tend to be? Yeah, they are close to water. Because um, as an insectivore, they rely on insects that use water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Well, thanks again, Ella. We really appreciate uh, your presentation. There's a lot of interesting facts and information there and uh, certainly things to think about. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.